And then lastly, friends, rewrite the passage using a structural diagram. Rewrite the passage using a structural diagram. Remember what we said a while ago? You don't need all seven steps. It depends on your passage. And friends, step number seven is limited to two types of genre. Listen to this. It's not there in your notes. Step number seven is limited to two types of genre. The poetic genre. How do you know if it's a poetic material in your Bible? The words are in the center. It's not straight left, straight right, margin. The words are in the center. It's a poetic material. And then to epistle, epistolary material. The epistles. They are the ones that you can actually write a structural diagram. Now, the way you analyze a narrative, the way you analyze a, uh, a parable, is you analyze it by sequence of events. Scene 1, kinuha niya yung kanyang mana sa tatay niya. Scene 2, humayo siya, iniwanan yung tatay niya. Scene 3, linustay niya yung kanyang kayamanan. Scene 4, naubos na, nagpapakain na lang siya ng baboy. Scene 5, nagrepent. You know, you analyze a narrative, a story by scenes, like a movie. But when you have a poetic material, when you have an epistle, friends, you can rewrite a passage using a structural diagram. And here's some of the definitions there, okay? No blanks there. Identify the transitions in the passage. Very important. You need to identify the transitions. Again, friends, it is true practice that you can determine actually the transitions. Remember the parable of the uh, laborers, the transition from salvation to service? That can be very subtle. But you need to identify the transition in the theme. So there's a transition in terms of grammar. There's a transition in terms of chronology, geography, or contextual transition. So you need to determine that. And then you summarize the main sections of the passage, state the synopsis of each section. Again, we're going to do this by example so that you can clearly see this. But friends, structural diagramming is a phrase-by-phrase -phrase chart of the text in the exact word order of the translation you use. So that means it's better to do structural diagramming with a word-for-word -word translation or at least something in between like NIV, word-for-word -word and thought-for-thought. -thought. Also, structural diagramming will give you an overview of the, of the writer's thought you know, in seminary, we call this syntactical displayed black diagram or mechanical layout. And I tell you, it's very complicated at times. I had a hard time because we had to do structural diagramming from the Greek. Wow, talaga naman nangangamote ko doon sa seminary. Hindi madali. So what I devised dear friends, just to help us, is we're just going to follow the English translation and we're just going to divide the passage into two, two columns, the main subject, and then we just have the descriptions to the main subject. That's the way you will just simplify the uh, diagramming. So here, we will do this by copying the text wording in order one phrase at a time. Okay, let's have an example. Jeremiah 17, 5 to 10. If you look into your Bibles, Jeremiah 17, 5 to 10, what type of material is this? Prose or poetry? Jeremiah 17, 5 to 10. Ano yung pagkaka-print dyan sa Bible nyo? Is it in the middle or is it uh, straight left, straight right margin? It's in the middle. This is what? Prose or poetry? This is poetic. Okay, this is a poetic material. And this is where God is talking. And so here's what we have here. Jeremiah 17, 5 to uh, 10. Okay, please follow very closely here. Look at the uh, board here. We're going to just separate, you know, structural diagram, main subject, on the left, and then the descriptions on the right. All right? Just follow. Again, it takes exercise. You know, you, you do this as often as you can. When you prepare your Sunday school lesson, Bible study, or sermon, I guarantee you this will help a lot in outlining. In outlining, this will be very helpful. Okay, let's start. This is what the Lord says. Let's start from there. Curse is the one. Okay? Medyo na una lang ng konti yun. Curse is the one who trusts in the Lord. We see here the main subject is the cursed one. And the first description is who trusts in the Lord. We will put the word who under the subject of one. So we'll put that there. Curse is the one who trusts. That's the first description. Who trusts in man. And then who defends. Where do we place the word who? Under what? Uh, under the same word one. Okay? Who depends on flesh for his strength. And then there's a connective end. And then whose? Under what subject is the word whose? The same subject, the cursed one. 
uh, whose heart turns away from the Lord. All right. And then verse 6, he. What's the subject of he? What's the subject? Still referring to the cursed one. This person who is described this way, he will be like, pagka like, what type of, of uh, figurative language? That's a simile. All right. That, it's not literal. It's simile. He will be like a bush in the wastelands. And then it says, he. What's the subject of he? Again, the cursed one, he will not see prosperity when it comes. And then he, what's the subject of he? The same subject, he will dwell in the parts places of the desert. And then look at this, preposition in. You put the preposition under the same preposition in. Look at that, two, prep two prepositions. This is what you call parallelism. It's parallel, one place described in two ways. So that means, friends, if you erase the first description, you replace that with this one. He will dwell in the parts place. You can replace that. He will dwell in a salt land. It's the same place described in two ways. Okay? So that's how you, uh, uh, you can separate them. All right. And then verse 7. Tell me verse 7. The same subject or different subject? It's different because subject number one is the cursed one. This one is the blessed, the blessed one, the blessed man. Who? Subject is man. Trust in the Lord. And then whose confidence? Where do we put the word whose? Under the word, under the subject man, whose confidence is in him, and then he will be like, under what subject? The same one, the blessed man, he will be like a tree planted by the water. That, what's the subject of that? That sends out its roots. That's the subject, the subject there is the tree. The tree that sends out its roots. So the person, is, he will be like a tree planted by the water. If you erase planted, he will be like a tree that sends out its roots by the stream. It, what's the subject of it? The tree, it does not fear when it heat comes. It's what's the subject of it? The tree, its leaves are always green. It, what's the subject? The tree, it has no worries in the year of drought and never. Where do you put, place the word never? Where do you place the word never? Two negatives. You have no worries and then never fails. No and then never. So two negatives, you just put them side by side or one over another. So at least you can distinguish there already. And then, so we have the first subject about what? The cursed one. The second subject about the blessed one. And then verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond course. Same subject or different subject? It's a different subject. So here verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. So there's a connective end. Where do we put the word beyond? Under what word? Uh huh. Above and beyond. Okay, those are the two descriptive words. The heart is deceitful above all things, and then the heart is beyond cure. Okay, so above and beyond. Who can understand it? The subject of it is what? The heart. Now, I cannot place the word it under here because it will already fall on the, you know, the computer won't allow us to do that. And so, if, if it's just a, you know, in my office, when I was still pastor in Cebu, when you enter my office, the first thing you see is a whiteboard. I have a whiteboard there. So, on, on Monday afternoon, when I start uh, exegeting my passage, I just write a uh, step number seven, make a, uh, 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 what do you call this? Yeah, this, this diagram. And then, I just step back and then look at my diagram and then I can clearly see, oops, there are three subjects here. There are three points on Sunday. That's biblical, three points, okay? <laughs> and then, oops, there's a word here. I need to research. That's a keyword. Another keyword here. Another keyword here. Okay, another, okay, I have four keywords here. I need to research that. Oops, there's a cultural background here. I need to look at that cultural background. Uh-huh. There's a uh, figurative language right here. I need to find out that. And so you, you, you look at your task the whole week. Oops. I need to get to the secretary, my outline by Thursday. Can I finish this by Thursday? You know, you begin to plan your week already based on your sermon. All right? And the good thing about expositor sermon is you preach whole books. You can plan your whole month. You can plan three months in advance. You can already think in advance what your study will be like. Ang hirap ng topical. Every Sunday, you have to think of a topic. Ano kaya ngayon Sunday? Anong topic na naman? You know, tapos ka na sa topic. Ano na naman topic next Sunday? And that becomes a so, you know, arduous work of uh, preparing a sermon. And that's why level three, we're going to train you on expository preaching, preaching through books. 
Now, I'm not saying topical is not good because some subjects, you cannot deal with it in any other way except topical. Alright? And so, but we need to learn how to do this. So, the Lord, I, the Lord, so who can understand it? Referring to the heart. But we'll just place the word who can understand it. We know that refers to the heart. I, the Lord, where do we place the word I? This is a rhetorical question, actually. Who can understand it? There's no human being who can understand the human heart except the Lord. And so we place the word I, answering the word who. I, the Lord, search the heart, and there's the connective end. Examine. Where do you place the word examine? The verb, examine. Under the word search. Two verbs right there. And so you have and examine, search the heart, examine the mind. Two. Where do you place the word two? That's a purpose statement. When you have a purpose statement too, you place it under the verb. Which is the closest verb to two? Examine. You. So place the word two. The reason why God will search the heart, examine the mind, is to reward a man according to his conduct. And then the word according. Where do you place the word according? Two words there. According, according. So that's the parallel. And so you have there. How many subjects for tomorrow? If we preach this tomorrow? How many points? Three points. All right. Again, very biblical. Three points outlined. And so... But you know what? You don't have to stick to three points. Baptists, they love three points. But you know, if you're the four, the four, I name four? Four square charts. You have four points, of course. Four square charts. So, iba iba, kanya kanya yan. All right. So, we have three subjects here. The first subject is the cursed one. After you, after you uh, d d divide them already, you give them a title or a summary, a synopsis. Let's just give this a title. Uh, the second one is verse 7 to verse 9, uh, verse 8, the blessed man. The third one is verse 9 to verse 10. All right? If we give this a title, we'll give the title for 5 and 6. We'll give that as the title as the way of the wicked. Verse 5 is description. Verse 6 is destination. And then verses 7 and 8, what we see here, is uh, the description here is the way of the blessed. Verse 7 is description. Verse uh, 8 is this, his destination. And then verses 9 and 10 is the way of the Lord, his diagnosis in verse 9, and then his decision in verse 10. And so if you put them together for your sermon outline tomorrow, <laughs> those who are pastors here, you can preach this tomorrow, the way of life, the way of the wicked, the way of the blessed, the way of the Lord, and so you can analyze these uh, five verses, five or six verses. And then, you know, that's the value of doing a structural diagram. It helps you. You see, did you notice where the outline came from? Did you notice where the outline came from? The outline came from the passage itself. It just floated out of the passage. Sometimes outlines are imposed on the text. And that's the problem because you have to, you know, you have to manipulate things in order for the outline to come up because the outline is coming outside the text, not from the text itself. And may mga pastor pa na talagang pinipilit yung outline. Gusto letter P lahat. Kahit hindi naman letter P, kaya yung kanyang outline. The past, the future, the past, the present, and the future. Baba, talaga namang letter P talaga lahat. Talagang pilit na pilit eh. You know? The past, the present, and the future. Ba, talaga nga naman. Okay, we still have just for you to have a, a taste of it. At the back of your mind, while there's an a, a empty uh, space there, a uh, blank side, please do a structural diagram of Romans 13. Remember, we have poetic material and this time a epistolary material. Just four verses. Do a structural diagram, 11, 12, 13, and 14. Come on, just give it a try and just have that sense, you know, of uh, trying to uh, do a structural diagram. So, okay, let's, let's just do that for 10 minutes and then we're almost done here. We're about to close already. But just have a sense, a, a, a taste. Yeah, yeah, any of the blank pages there, you know, at the back, any blank page there, just, just do it. Okay, let's do this together. Sampo lang naman yan para masubukan natin. So, and do this. So, yan na yung papagawa niya and do this. We don't know exactly what this do this. Pero, what is this? Sabi niya, understanding the present time. Now, I need to have an understanding. Eh, kasi sabi niya, do this, understanding the present time. The reason why he's asking you to do this, if you understand the time that we are in, you know, the kind of time that we are in, 
Unang-una sabi niya, yung present time na yan, the hour has already come for you, sabi niya, to wake up from your slumber. Unang-una pinapagawa niya, do this, you need to wake up from your slumber. Bakit? Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. And then he added another description of the, ta- the hour, the present time. The night is nearly over. The night of sin is nearly over. This is just an additional description of the time that we have. The hour has already come. Uh, salvation is nearer now. The night is almost uh, is nearly over. The day is almost here. And then, the next thing that he wants us to do, let us put aside the deeds of, dark- the deeds of darkness. So do, do what? Number one, you need to wake up now because the hour has already come. The night is nearly over. That, that what next thing he wants you to do is put aside the deeds of darkness. And then he said, put on the thing that you need to do. Put aside, put on the armor of light. And then he said in verse 13, he, he delineated the things that you need to put aside or put on. Behave decently as in the daytime. And he said, not in carousing and uh, drunkenness. Again, he comes here in uh, by twos, carousing uh, <coughs> drunkenness, in, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and uh, jealousy. So, he's asking us to do what? Wake up from your slumber. Wag ka tutulog-tulog. This is now the time to, to uh, be awake for the Lord Jesus Christ. Next, you need to put aside and put on. What are those things? Behave decently. This, these uh, three uh, couplets here. And then he said, the next thing that you need to do because of the time that we have is you need to clothe yourselves now with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful, uh, of the, the desires of the flesh. So when he's asking us to, to do things, first of all, he's talking about the reason, the motivation why we need to do this because of the present time. Many descriptions about the present time. One description, the hour has already come. Another description, uh, he said here, the... Our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Another description is the night is nearly over, the day is almost here. That's the motivation because of the present time. He's trying to paint to us the picture that it's almost here. The night of sin is almost done. The sun is already on the horizon. And so three things he wants us to do based on this motivation, based on this reason. He said, do three things. Number one, wake up. That's the first action point. Number two, he said, put aside, put on. That's the second point of action. And then number three, by the way, this one, he delineated the, the different things that we need to be uh, putting aside. And then number three, yeah, that's the, those are the things. Number three is, clothe yourselves, do not think uh, about how to gratify. That's the third action point. And so you can analyze that. You can come up with a sermon outline. If you come up with a sermon outline, those are three points again. Three points based on this motivation, three-point outline. So, we're going to entitle this, number one, the title is, What Time Is It? And then, point number one, it's time to wake up. Point number two, it's time to clean up. Point number three, it's time to dress up. Oh, tapos. May sermon ka na bukas, kapatid. So, uh, again, if you cannot copy this, it's okay because it's all in the DVD. All right. All right, friends, we're done here. Here's the summary now. Exegetical investigation, there are seven letter R's. Come on, tell me please, the first letter R, read the passage like a pro. Second letter R, realize your subjectivity. Third letter R, retrace the historical background. Fourth letter R, relate the passage contextually. Fifth letter R, Recognize the literary genre and figures of speech. Sixth letter R, research the meaning of keywords. The seventh letter R, rewrite the passage using a structural diagram. So read like a pro, realize your subjectivity, retrace, relate, recognize, research, and rewrite. All right? So we have all of those seven steps in exegetical investigation. Now, friends, what we, have, what we have just studied here, friends, is just awareness. That's the first thing. We need to be aware of what we need to do. Now you are aware. But friends, I want you to do something, uh, something more than just being aware. Number two, I want you to make a conscious effort to apply the things that we have learned. I have challenged you, Bible study leaders, uh, teachers, please exercise doing a structural diagram. It will help you a lot. 
gather the resources that you need in order to discover the, the root meaning, the etymology, but take a conscious effort. And then number three, I want you to train yourself as an Apollos. Make it as your project to be like Apollos, that when he preaches, he is on fire. Pinag-aagawan sa Church of Corinth. And so again, we need to act on these things because if you don't act on these things, friends, it's just a bunch of notes which will just be put aside on your bookshelf. And so hermeneutics and, exe and exegetical investigation, we put them together. Friends, in order for us to study it grammatically, we need to read, we need to recognize, we need to research, we need to rewrite if you are to study it grammatically. If you are to study it historically, friends, you need to read, realize, retrace, and research. In order for you to study it culturally, you need to read, realize, and retrace. In order to study it contextually, again, you need to read, realize, relate, research, and rewrite. If you need to study it literarily, you need to read, retrace, recognize, and research. If you need to understand it logically, you need to read, realize, relate, and research. So friends, the reason why we do all of this, why we look up the exact meaning of the word, is because we believe in what? We believe in inspiration. Because if it's not inspired, you don't need to do research. Because it's only a human endeavor. But we believe that the Holy Spirit actually guided the writers. They have a reason why the Holy Spirit chose that particular word. And that's why word study is very important. What type of inspiration do we believe in? Plenary verbal inspiration. And because of that, we have four convictions under the ground. We believe it is inerrant, it is authoritative, it has unity, and it has mystery. And the Bible is not only divine, it is, uh, it is a human book, and therefore we understand it grammatically, historically, culturally, contextually, literarily, and logically. And friends, to be able to do that, we need to read the passage, realize our, our subjectivity, retrace the historical background, relate the context, recognize the literary genre, research the keywords, and rewrite the passage using a structural diagram. Friends, I believe personally, and this is what I pass on to you, this is how you study the Bible accurately. This is how we study the Bible. And so just putting it all together, now, I know that's the big picture that we have there. That's the big picture that we want to show you on how to do exegetical investigation. If you, conduct, if you have the whole Apollos project, the, I mean the biggest picture that we were going to show you is that the pastor, the preacher, the teacher is like a tightrope walker. And as a tightrope walker, you need a balancing pole. You need to balance two worlds. You need to balance the biblical world, and you need to balance the contemporary world, the world of the ancient text and the world of your audience. That's the balance that you need to have. And in order to do that, understand it biblically, you need exegetical investigation, the seven-letter R's. Okay, we, in order to do the contemporary understanding your audience, you need to do theological reflection. And then, when you actually preach, that's the homiletical presentation, when you stand before the congregation, so exegetical investigation is seven letter R's, read, realize, retrace, relate, recognize, research, and rewrite. And then theological reflection, you need to define, determine, decide, design, discover, develop, and devote enough time to write the sermon manuscript. And then when you stand before the congregation, you need to set the purpose of the preacher, the passion of the preacher, the pattern of the preacher, the process of the preacher, the projection of the preacher, the practice of the preacher, and the props of the preacher. So that's the complete picture of the Apollos project. And the teachers here that will be training, that's a heart and soul. You don't change that. That's what we want to teach the people. From start to finish, up to, they stand, up to the time when they stand before the congregation. So that's the full picture, the big picture of the Apollos project. Now friends, after all is said and done, I know, I can already picture in my mind how you feel about all of this. This is how you feel. Parang sinasabi niyo ngayon, nako Pastor Roy, 
I'll just go back to as the Spirit leads. I don't think I'll have time to study all of this. But friends, this is not the right attitude. The right attitude after learning all of this, this is the right attitude. That's how. And it comes with a prayer. Come on, let's all stand. Let's all stand. And let's pray this prayer together. Everybody now, let's pray this aloud. Pray this prayer. Ready? Pray. Lord, I want to be faithful to your word. Help me to study your word diligently and handle it accurately so I may present myself as a workman who has nothing to be ashamed. So help me, God. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. Praise the Lord. Praise God. That's it. That's the Apollos Project. Praise God.